Alrighty, SY Sports back with another video. I will be doing my top 10 coaches coming into this season. Um, I'm getting rid of my, or I'm not going to be doing the trailer at the beginning of the videos anymore. I, I just wanted to change it up. I liked it at first, and now I'm just really not liking it. I think it's too long, but that's near here or there. We're here to talk uh, some football. So, like I said, I'll be doing my top 10 coaches, but first I'm going to start off with some honorable mentions. I actually got quite a few. So my honorable mentions, I have Mario Cristobal. Uh, he built up Oregon. Now he's at Miami. Um, next would be Mac Brown. He is an, probably a Hall of Fame coach, but he hasn't won. The reason I didn't put him in my top 10 is because he hasn't won a national title since like 2005. And he's been all right at UNC. They had the one good year, but he they should have been better last year, and I think that brought him back down. He's still probably top like twenty, but he's not in my top ten anymore. Uh, next would be Matt Campbell. Matt Campbell, even though they went seven and five and went way under expectations. He's turned Iowa, Iowa State into a great program out in the Big 12. Iowa State's one coach away from being a Kansas-type team because they don't have the branding and the, rec and the recruiting base to consistently be good. So Matt Campbell's done a great job there. Uh, I have Kirk Ferentz, longest tenured coach in college football. Sicily keeps Iowa at A-plus wins a year. Uh, he's got a few Big Ten championships. Just a great coach. Hall of Fame coach. Uh, next would be Pat Fitzgerald. Uh, he's turned Northwestern, one of the highest academic schools, into a good football team. Yes, they've had some down years, but they've had some great years. And what he has done there is an unbelievable job. And then finally, I have Mark Stoops. I was debating between who I have at 10 and Mark Stoops at 10. He's made Kentucky a top five team in the SEC. And for being a smaller brand, more of a basketball school, when, being able to win 10 games in that conference with what he has is pretty damn impressive. And number 10, I have Mike Gundy. Mike Gundy's been at Oklahoma State forever, consistently winning eight games. He's really made Oklahoma State, since Mac Brown left Texas, he's made Oklahoma State probably the second best program. He's just had that bug of, Oklahoma, and there's nothing he can do about it. He is, could never really beat them, but he's been to the Big 12 championships. I think he's won a couple. He's been to big bowl games. He's he's made Oklahoma State one of the better top 15 programs in the country consistently. Well, more 15 to 25. All right, at number nine, I have Jim Harbaugh. He's back in my top 10 after winning that Big 10 championship. What can I say? He's got a great resume at Stanford, great resume in the NFL, came back, instantly made Michigan back to a good football team. Yeah, they've had they've been under expectation or they haven't met expectations. But he's his worst season was eight and five. Yeah, you can say his worst season was the COVID season, but COVID was up and down for everybody, uh, except maybe the SEC schools. Number eight. Kyle Whittingham. What Kyle Whittingham has done at Utah is unbelievable. To be a group of five school, to transition to the uh, Pac-12, Power 5 at the time, now to transition just from not being a bottom Power 5, but to being one of the best Power 5. And now, coming into the season, people are talking about them making the playoffs. I mean, he's done a hell of a job there. Hell of a job. Ten win seasons. Good bowls. Good bowl wins. Kyle Whittingham in number eight. Number seven, I have Lincoln Riley. Uh, Lincoln Riley hasn't been around that long for me to put him in my top five, but he's been to a couple playoffs. He hasn't won. But you you have to put him in your top ten. I mean, his worst season was last year, and they won 11-2. and two. Like, there's no reason for him to not be in a top ten or anybody's top ten unless there's just a hate factor, which I'm hearing from Oklahoma fans. Anyways, Lincoln Riley at number seven. Number six, I have Ryan Day. Yes, Ryan Day. 
I think his his only loss in the Big Ten is to Michigan, I believe. But he's only been there for three years, and one was the COVID year. So I, he was he was handed a great program. Now this year will definitely be the year to where I can tell if he's going to be in that top five or not. You know, he, he last year they fi- he's finally getting more of his players, and they had the worst year they've had in a few years. Even though they went ten and two, it was the worst year they've had in a while. I just I need one more year to see if he can actually do this or not. Ryan Day at number six. Number five, I have Brian Kelly. What else can I say about Brian Kelly? Uh, constantly winning ten games, brought Notre Dame back from the Charlie Weiss era. From the Charlie Weiss era, been to multiple playoffs, been to a championship, but he always has this one problem of running into Saban in the postseason and getting blown out. Other than that, he's in my opinion, he's easily a top five coach, Hall of Fame coach. Number four. Now, the only reason I put Jimbo Fisher at number four is because he did win the national championship. That was basically my main reason for putting him over Brian Kelly is that he actually got over the hump. Yes, he had a good quarterback and a good team to help him, but he's very deserving. He was really good at Florida State, taking over for uh, Bobby Bowden. Then he went to now he's at Texas A&M, and he's bringing Texas A&M basically out of the ashes. Yeah, he's only won <clears throat> more than eight games once since he's been there, but he's been recruiting very well. Clearly, this recruiting class he has coming in could be an even more of a game changer. To, he's consistently having top five classes, and then he brings in this class. Maybe Texas A&M goes even further, and he gets another championship. Number three... I think it's clear as day. It's Kirby Smart. He finally secured an absolute number three spot after winning the championship. And from what I'm seeing is that Georgia is not slowing down. So if he wins another, could you debate that he's better than the number two spot of Dabo Sweeney? Probably. Now he has to win another one to be there. That's the only reason why Dabo is there. Dabo is consistently winning 10-plus games a year. Last year was his worst year in a, in a long time, and they went 10-3. Dabo's tenure is the reason why he is above Kirby. Not just because he has one more national championship, but because he's done it for a longer period. He's consistently won for a longer period of time. And then everybody's number one is Nick Saban, greatest coach of all time. Don't think I need any explanation for that. Uh, so, yeah, there's my uh, top 10 coaches coming into the season. Uh, this was a quicker video just because it was more of like off the top of my head of who I think is where. I didn't really go into analytics for coaching. I just kind of picture or I kind of take my coaches' rankings off of eye tests more than past records. I mean, I do look into it a little bit, but I feel like if you're predicting a season, you can't go back on one of the coaches that's been out of school for 12 years and say, oh, well, in his third, fourth, and fifth year, he won 12 games three straight years in a row, and then he goes eight and four for the next six, you know? I just feel like you have to kind of look at what's happened over the past three to five years and kind of combine all that, and that's where I get my list from. Hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, If you agree with me, great. I'd like to hear about it. If you don't agree with me, I would like to hear why. Um, so please comment down below, like, share, subscribe to, subscribe to the channel, and I hope to see you in the next one. See ya.